Dr. Topalian just gave a really excellent introduction to what I'm going to say, and we're going to hit some of the, the same points, which should give you confidence that we're telling the truth, um, and uh, also agreeing with uh, Dr. Pardol from this morning as well. And, and as I said before, I'm, I'm very happy to be here and actually see some, some patients and colleagues, and, um, and you know, I think this is a very important uh, type of venue for, for all of us to participate in. This is a new type of uh, approach to cancer treatment. It's one that is just now beginning to enjoy success. Um, and I think that we need to learn more about it every day. But um, it has not been uh, a short journey to the success of immunotherapy, uh, specifically to treat melanoma. Um, to give you a little bit more of the background, uh, in addition to what Dr. Topalian provided, um, many of you know that the eminent journal Science named this field of cancer immunotherapy to be the breakthrough of the year in 2013. But um, recognition for the achievements of this field were rather fallow, um, uh, going back over 120 years. And I'll just point to an ancestor of mine um, in the center there, William Coley, who was the chief of surgery at, at what was at the time the New York Cancer Hospital, but now is called Memorial Sloan Kettering, who actually first hypothesized that the immune system could be used to treat cancer based upon a really simple observation that when he did surgery for patients to remove their cancer, quite often, because it was the 1890s, they developed infections. Um, and he, he saw, actually, that patients who got infections after cancer surgery seemed to live longer. And he hypothesized that those infections were actually leading to the mobilization of some sort of internal defense that was protecting the patients from the cancer. And not much was known about the immune system at the turn of the 19th and 20th century, but it turned out that he was largely correct. It's just that we didn't have the science to prove it. Um, as Dr. Topalian told you, I think the first major step forward, the first breakthrough before the one in 2013, was actually the development of this medicine, interleukin-2. Um, also nice to see that, in fact, um, even that breakthroughs happen repetitively, but also things in Russia and the Soviet Union seem to actually be repeating themselves, unfortunately, <laughs> as well. Um, but uh, this is the data for high-dose interleukin-2. It's actually data from Dr. Atkins, who you heard from this morning, who actually showed that there was a, a subset of patients treated with high-dose interleukin-2 that it can actually be cured uh, of metastatic melanoma. Now, it's not nearly as many people as we'd like to see. It's probably somewhere between 2 and 5 percent, depending upon how you, you count the, um, those folks. But the fact is that people who are in remission from metastatic melanoma at two years after high-dose IL-2 are still in remission 10 years later. Um, and so that really gives you an idea of what immunotherapy can deliver when it is successful. Uh, we're all vaccinated against things as babies. Our immune systems remember those vaccine responses. Um, and the same, hopefully, is true of immunotherapy, that once the immune system learns to recognize the cancer, it might not be necessary to eliminate every single cancer cell from someone's body. All we need to do is restore the ability of the immune system to hold it back. So that's why um, those of you who are patients and family members here may hear from your doctor that stable disease is okay, all right? because as long as it's not getting worse, that is uh, a very strong uh, piece of evidence that the immune system has come into equilibrium with the cancer and has kept it from moving ahead. Um, as many of you know, uh, there was a medicine approved in 2011 um, called ipilimumab to treat metastatic melanoma. Dr. Topalian showed you the primary data um, for that. And basically what that medicine uh, called ipilimumab does is it blocks this molecule called CTLA-4, which serves as a molecular break. Uh, for the immune system. This is a, a slide that I use a lot to talk with my patients and their families uh, because immunotherapy is, is quite complicated. Um, it's taken us over 100 years to even begin to understand it. So how are we supposed to explain it to you, you know, in a couple of hours in clinic? So uh, I'm, kind of a, I'm, I'm kind of a gearhead, right? So uh, I, uh, I, I like to reduce things to simple mechanical car-like analogies. So uh, the antigen or the target of the immune system is recognized by a receptor on the T cell. And that's very much like 
uh, inserting the ignition key into the, uh, into the car and turning it. But that's not enough to get the car moving. The car also needs an accelerator. And that accelerator is a molecule called CD28. And um, that is what really gets the T-cell extra activated. Um, when uh, you have a car that has its uh, ignition key turned and a foot down on the gas, um, if there's no brake, then you're going to run into trouble. Um, and so that is what this molecule CTLA-4 is. It's a molecular brake that keeps the T-cell from speeding out of control. And what ipilimumab does is it very temporarily, for a few weeks, cuts those brakes so that the immune system can accelerate harder than it otherwise could and overcome some of the immune suppression that melanoma actually throws up in the way of an effective immune response. And so what we're trying to do with medicines like ipilimumab is to cut these breaks, let the immune system function at a higher rev level, um, and, and let it recognize cancer. And then you might imagine that, um, in reference to what Dr. Topalian mentioned, that if you introduced a vaccine at that point, you could steer this now speeding car um, toward a target of interest on the cancer. So the data for, for ipilimumab, even going as far back as 2000, was actually um, quite impressive. That some of the first patients treated here, patient treated uh, at the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, um, had a, a very impressive response. So these are CAT scans on top. These dark objects on either side are lungs. Um, and the red circles are drawn around lung metastases. And this is the pre-treatment image. And you can see after treatment, all of those lung metastases went away, as did even an incidentally noted brain metastasis, shown here with the arrow, which also went away. So there are some patients who get better really quickly. Um, there are other patients who don't get better really quickly. Um, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about this in the talk that I give to the whole group later, but we'll put you guys to the head of the class, and you'll know the punchline already. This is a patient who I treated um, in the phase two trials of ipilimumab, now going back about eight years ago. Um, and he got the standard four doses of ipilimumab. Um, and he, at the end of uh, the, the 12 weeks, this, this is a CAT scan, and this big gray organ here is the liver. And you can see there are a lot more dark gray spots after treatment than there were before. Um, and so, you know, we really thought that this patient was, was having um, an example of drug failure. Um, and uh, I had sort of prepared other options and discussions for him about what we could do next. But uh, I don't know how patients are here in Chicago, but patients in New York are kind of in your face. Um, and so, um, so he, um, he, he stopped me in the doorway and said, uh, listen, don't tell me what the scan showed. I have to tell you something first. I feel better. Um, and so I uh, did what any self-respecting oncologist would do. I turned right around, left the room, and made sure I was looking at the right person's scans because these are not the scans of someone who should be feeling better. Um, and so after convincing myself that I was doing my job properly, um, I sat down and listened to him tell me why he felt better. And he said that his fevers had gone away, his sweats had gone away, um, and he had pain in his liver, which also went away. And so it was one of those kind of uh, sort of of light bulb moments when you feel like all of a sudden you need a new idea. Um, and the new idea was being had by many of us around the world at the time that this type of treatment doesn't work the same way as chemotherapy or targeted therapy or radiation where you expect the cells to stop dividing and the patients to feel better at a very predictable point in time. Here, we're not treating the person directly. We're treating their immune system. Um, and the immune system is what is treating the tumor. And so that may happen at um, unpredictable points in time. And in fact, these things may actually look bigger because they're not full of more melanoma cells, but perhaps they're full of more immune cells, which is making them artificially look bigger. Uh, so it might actually even be a good sign, although I think that's a bit of a stretch. Um, but without any really better answers and with the, the patient feeling better, we suggested that maybe he just have another set of scans done about eight weeks later, which he did, and almost everything went away, and it continued to go away. And he didn't receive any other treatment for the ensuing about eight years, um, except for some maintenance doses of ipilimumab as part of the trial that he was on. But this was a strong um, indicator of the fact that the way that we judge the activity of immunotherapy is different than other forms of therapy, which I'm going to talk in more detail about later. 
Um, and it, but it also is why sometimes oncologists will suggest to their patients that if they're feeling better, maybe they just want to get another scan done and not uh, all of a sudden change gears to a different treatment because it may be that the treatment hasn't had enough time to show benefit. Um, all told, when we look at the when we look at the computer, that's not okay. Uh, when we look at the data for ipilimumab. Um, this was data presented by Steve Hody last year, a uh, colleague from the Dana-Farber. Um, he uh, actually presented that just over 20% of patients had um, survival that lasted three years or longer. And so that is higher than some of the data that Dr. Topalian shared with you, which I think shows you what the impact of this type of therapy can be. Um, but it's also um, a strong indicator that uh, we need to work harder because that's still not good enough. And that's really where the idea of combination therapies comes from. Um, so the, but again, you see this very characteristic flattening of that survival curve, that people who uh, are alive at two or three years tend to be alive for a long time thereafter, similar to what we saw for IL-2, but not with as many patients at longer time points, simply because it's a newer medicine.